My name is Jonathan Tower. I've been a venture investor for more than 20 years. Uh, I began my career as an entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was 19 years old, when I was an undergraduate a student, and uh, ended up running that company from zero to 60, so to speak. Uh, sold that business and knew pretty quickly that I'd always want to work with startups as an investor, as an advisor, uh, as an operator, and I generally have for more than 20 years. Uh, as a venture investor, I've invested in more than 100 companies. Uh, 30 of those companies have had significant outcomes, uh, billion dollar outcomes in some cases. I've had nine unicorns across those companies and uh, been very fortunate to work with companies like Dollar Shave Club, um, Jet.com, uh, Freshly, Mapbar Technology, and many, many others that have gone on to great outcomes. Um, yeah. Well, venture capital has been one of the strongest performing asset classes in the last 20 years. If you look at um, public markets, if you look at real estate, if you look at a variety of other asset classes, um, the, the alternative asset class, and that encompasses private equity and venture capital, has strongly outperformed most of those throughout the last 15, 20 year cycle. And there are lots of reasons behind that. Um, and if you look at just the the S&P 500, the 10 most uh, valuable companies in the world today, um, more than half of those started off as startups, as companies that were backed by venture capital funds, right? the Facebooks, the Googles, uh, uh, firms of that nature. And so venture capital has been a tremendous catalyst for economic growth across the world, not just in technology, although technology is certainly the area uh, that's most commonly associated with venture capital. But the, the, the idea of venture capital investing and what VCs do uh, has been really one of the biggest catalysts for some of the greatest economic growth across the world. Um, and so I think all investors should have venture capital in their portfolio, should have an allocation for venture capital, um, regardless of their, their specialization around technology, just because it is such a great driver of economic growth and job creation across the world. Yeah, I think you should be asking the questions of what am I solving for? What am I trying to accomplish as an investor? Obviously, we all want good returns on our money, but you can get good returns on your money in lots of different things. So I think an important question that investors should ask is, what am I trying to accomplish? Is it, um, am I trying to stimulate economic growth in my home market? Am I trying to get diversification in my portfolio across other, other investments that I have? Um, so I think that's, that's very important. I think the next question you want to ask is, what is my time horizon? Right? What can I legit, legitimately ask myself in terms of how long can I put this capital to work? Uh, do I need to get a return in a short time frame or can I, can I have my capital put to work for eight to 10 years? Uh, I think where a lot of investors get it wrong is they don't have the right expectations. They don't ask themselves the right questions before they get into venture capital around the, the reality that this is a somewhat illiquid asset class, right? This is not like buying a stock on the stock market. You can't just sell it whenever you decide you wanna, you wanna get out of that particular security. Uh, there are long hold periods. So you need to make sure that that coincides with what your time horizon is and your risk tolerance as well. And are you prepared for that illiquidity at times? And I think the final question to ask is around that there are capital calls associated with your investment in a venture capital firm. In other words, if you make an investment in a fund, you're not giving them all the capital the first day you make the commitment. You do it over time through capital calls. And so you need to manage your cash flow situation in such a way that when those firms make those capital calls, you can meet those capital calls. You have the liquidity to continue to support that commitment. And I think some LPs don't ask that question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think a lot of investors want to be angel investors, and that's very noble. Angel investing is very hard to do well, um, and it's usually a very expensive school of hard knocks if you don't know what you're doing and you don't really have an insight into that particular sector. 
And so an example of that would be uh, if there is a high net worth individual and they made their money in real estate or mining or manufacturing and they're looking at a tech startup, they have to ask themselves, how can I be helpful? Do I really understand the business they're in? Uh, if they're an early stage company, they, meet a, they might need a lot of handholding. Can I provide that handholding? Do I know enough to be helpful if I don't have any experience in that sector? So I think angel investing is tough because very often you don't, the investor himself or herself doesn't have the skill set to really help the company. And that's why I would typically suggest that most investors that want to be into venture capital start by putting a little bit of money to work in funds, being a limited partner in venture capital funds, because venture capital funds are professionally managed by people who know what they're doing, who've been VCs for a while, who have a network that they can leverage for deal flow that most angels simply do not. And so I would usually recommend it if a high net worth individual or a family office wants to invest in venture capital, do it as an LP in funds first. Learn the business. Get a feel for what you're trying to solve for. Understand the sectors that are interesting to you. Understand the stages that are interesting for you. You may not like early stage. You may like later stage. You don't know that until you foray into these different uh, funds. So I think it's good to get your feet wet by getting into some funds. If over time you begin to build uh, enough conviction that now you want to do direct investing or angel investing, that's fine and you can do both at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. But I think it really helps to be an LP in a bunch of funds early, learn the business, understand how venture capital works, and then over time begin direct investing if that's what you want to do. Yeah, so the, the short answer is, you know, early stage is high risk, high reward. Later stage is, you know, a little bit lower risk, but also lower reward. That's sort of a very simplistic way. Um, but they are very different. And if you look in the ecosystem of venture capital funds, you don't see a lot of funds that do beginning to end investing. Usually you'll see early stage specialists, later stage specialists, because it is a different animal. Um, by its very nature and by its name, an early stage company is going to have a lot more risk associated with it because it's very early, it's very young. Maybe they don't have a product yet, or maybe if they have a product or service, there isn't much in terms of revenue. And so you have, you have execution risk, you have product risk, you have technology risk, you have all these risks that you need to mitigate as an investor to get comfortable deploying capital. As the company gets more mature, a lot of those risks begin to go away because the company now has a product. You now have revenues for a period of time that you can then underwrite in terms of your investment thesis. Um, so now at that point becomes a question of can the company continue to grow? It's proven that consumers want the product or businesses want the product. It's proven that it can generate revenue. Maybe it's proven that it can be profitable. Those are all the types of risks that you generally solve for as an early stage company. But as you migrate to a later stage company, those usually have gone away. And now it's a question of how big can this get? But your returns are going to go down because now the company is worth more. So your investment in that company is going to be a smaller share of that company. And so maybe in a later stage investment, you might hope for twice your money or three times your money back if it's a successful outcome. Early stage, we try to get five to 10x our money back because again, higher risk, but higher reward. And we know that by investing in early stage companies, a lot of those companies will not materialize, amount to much, they'll go to zero. And so we build that into our investment thesis so that as they go to zero, we still have enough companies that do really, really well to make up for all the companies that fail. So I say the most important thing to, to think about as an investor is where are you comfortable? Are you willing to take the early stage risk to get that higher retur return a reward profile? Or are you more comfortable with something that's a little bit lower risk, but also understand that your rewards are going to be probably a lot lower? I would say that typically what they do is they don't understand time horizon. Like I mentioned before, uh, it's very important to understand that venture capital is still a fairly illiquid asset class and your capital is, may not be creating the returns in a couple of years. It might be several years before you see returns coming back from your initial investment. So make sure you manage that risk and some LPs don't. 
I say the second mistake that I see LPs make is they don't understand that when they're an investor in a venture capital fund, they don't have voice and vote in the investments that that fund makes. They are, by definition, giving their capital to somebody who is going to be a good steward of that capital, hopefully, and make the investment decisions for them, right? An LP is paying a management fee, and that management fee is to pay for management of that capital, to make the investment decisions, to properly underwrite investments, to manage those investments post-investment after the, after the capital has been committed. And so the limited partner is not involved in the day-to-day -day functioning of that particular firm, and they have to get comfortable with that. Some investors want to be involved day to day and it's not really appropriate. So I would say those are two things that some investors do incorrectly. Um, and then I would say also just managing their liquidity, making sure that they understand that they will meet, need to meet capital calls as the company begins to deploy capital into investments. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd say those are the three things that come to mind in terms of the, the most common mistakes I see. Well, every firm is different. Um, every venture capital firm has a different strategy of what they're trying to solve for. Obviously, good returns is probably first and foremost for most funds because without good returns, you won't survive. Your fund will go away, and that's the end of your, your venture activities. Um, but I think for us and for me, the question I like to ask myself is, do I want to see this in the world? When I back a founder, is the founder solving a complicated problem that has global implications, global reach. Do, is this a problem around the world or does it have the potential to solve problems around the world or is it more of a niche opportunity that might only be applicable in this geographic region or this particular area? If it's too small, it's generally not the right opportunity for me. So I think that's number one. Um, and then I think thematically, what I generally gravitate towards are opportunities where there is a strong technology component to it. Um, and so, you know, are you solving a problem using a technology solution? Because when you solve it with technology, there's generally some differentiation around that. There's something that you've built that's hard to replicate that can be your competitive moat. If it's a pure service or a pure product that can be knocked off, it's less attractive for me, typically speaking. So those are things that I consider as well. I think the final thing is around, and maybe I've already answered this in the, in the question, is you know, when I look for opportunities, I wanna feel that this, this is an opportunity that in 20 years from now, I'm gonna look back on with pride that I was a part of, that this is gonna be a company that's gonna be around for a long time, it's gonna be creating tremendous value for a long time. Um, and if it doesn't seem to solve that for me, I'm probably less interested. Now, again, I don't want to uh, disparage any area of investment. You can make money doing lots of different things. Uh, but for me, just an example, like gaming, entertainment, esports, probably less exciting for me. Because in my view, I don't see that as really moving the needle on lots of societal needs around the world. A lot of global challenges around the world uh, are not solved with maybe a different video game or a different way to experience something that to me is not, uh, is not meaningful enough. It's a bit of a trivial investment. So I tend to stay away from those. Uh, but again, I don't mean to, mean to disparage anybody else, but that's just how I think about the types of investments that I like to be involved with and the things that make me proud to be an investor. Yeah, um, I look for a number of things in my founding teams that I backed. Um, I think, above all, integrity, unwavering integrity. I don't like to invest in people that are dishonest or shade the truth or aren't transparent. So that's game changer for me. But assuming that there is that integrity in that founder, I like to find real grit and tenacity. I want to find founders that are mission-driven, even though that's a very overused term. What mission-driven means is... Is the founder just compelled to solve this problem on their own and they would wanna do it regardless of whether there's a business around it or are they doing it because it's a way to make money, right? Are they missionary or are they mercenary? Um, a missionary founder is gonna just go after this thing because they really see a problem that they wanna solve and they have a unique way of solving it. I like that grit, I like that tenacity because what it shows me is when they get obstacles coming at them, which they inevitably will, they'll find a way around it because they really wanna solve this problem. 
A founder that's more focused on the financial reward may just get discouraged if they get too much resistance, shrug and go back and get their job at their, you know, their last employer and give it up. And, and that's not what I want to back. I want to back founders that are really passionate about what they do and about solving a problem because I'm giving them capital to do it with. And so I want to make sure that they're a good steward of my capital. So I look for that grit. I look for that tenacity. And I'd say the final thing that I look for is coachability, right? A great founder is confident, is headstrong, is a little bit stubborn, and you want that, but is also able to understand what they don't know and are able to take in information that may not be in concert with what they think is the right way to go, but is able to say, okay, I'm wrong. I'm willing to listen to people who have more experience than me. I'm willing to listen to people who can coach me to the right outcome. Uh, that's what a great founder can do. A founder that's too headstrong on a way forward and is wrong and is not willing to take in other advice is usually, uh, is usually a disaster waiting to happen. So I look for those qualities in the founders that I back. Obviously, we're in a very frothy, uh, complicated market right now. Um, we've seen a tremendous uptick in valuations and activity in venture. Early this year, we saw that come down, and now we're in a difficult moment where you're hearing about layoffs, you're hearing about valuations coming down. I still believe this is a phenomenally great time to be investing in venture capital, and let me explain why. When markets are very active and frothy, it's actually a difficult time to invest in the way that I like to invest because I'm competing with every other VC fund out there, right? My money is green, their money is green, we're all competing. That means we're charging up valuations, we're pushing up terms, and that gets complicated. And so when markets begin to fall as they are now, that, com that the competition generally uh, goes away and that allows me to get better terms for my capital. Uh, it's also good for startups because now startups are not competing with each other as much. Even though it's difficult and it's sad to hear of startups that are failing and doing layoffs, it also means there's a lot more people available. And so the startups that are still surviving are able to hire better. They're able to keep their costs lower. Um, generally, the cost of everything comes down in a down market because rents are cheaper. Uh, the cost of hiring lawyers goes down. Um, the cost for hiring talent goes down. So all those things are good for startups because that means me as an investor, my capital goes farther. My money has more impact. And so it's actually a great time to be investing in startups. And history is on my side. If you look at the dot-com implosion of the early 2000s, if you look at the last recession in the late 2008, 2009, those are great time to be investing in. Some of the biggest companies that exist today, the Facebooks, the Googles, they were started in bad markets. And so this is actually an exceptional time to be investing, and I'm very actively investing to this day.